thing I'll, I'll start off by saying is that obviously you know something, I think something is a great idea when you instantly think, I wish I'd have thought of that. And uh, <laughs> today's guest, uh, Gene Dollars, um, made me think just that. A, a British yellow set in the north of England. Uh, I'm really excited to hear all about it. Thanks so much for joining us. That's okay. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. This uh, this started off originally as a short film, actually. Um, and then I was co-writing it with uh, um, Alex, who, who's co the movie with me. And then we just kept writing. And we're like, oh, we passed 30 pages here. This, this Short films, generally, you know, you want them to be about 10 minutes or less for film mm-hmm. festivals. And then it just started getting a bit more and more. I'm like, oh, well, I guess we're writing a feature now. And then we just thought, well, we've got money for a short, but we don't have money for a feature. But we'll see, we'll just see if we can find it somewhere where, where we finish. I, I love the. I don't. I don't. I don't want to make anything too spoilerific for people. Um, I want them to to discover it themselves. I'm really interested in that. You know, I suppose my first question really is, why Jalo? What is it about Jalo that speaks to you? Uh, I'm a massive fan of Italian cinema, specifically from I'd say like late '60s to mid '80s, which is kind of the height for me of. Horror, Italian horror and crime. I'm, I'm a big crime movie fan, a big horror fan. More more horror than crime, but um, yeah, like crime as well. But uh, yeah, yeah, love Italian horror movies. Um, just love the atmosphere, the surrealism of a lot of it, which I think is helped by the the kind of the dubbing, you know, that they used to do, and and the slightly out of sync voices, and all these little things add to, to the to the atmosphere and the look of the movies. And they're a lot more intense than most uh, other movies, maybe maybe by the you know, Americans or other European countries. You know, the Italians are very um, passionate people, and I think that shows <laughs> in the movies. Oh yeah, the for sure. Stuff. Yeah. And obviously, That's with good... with the with the history of art, and you know how um, you know cinematographers, obviously being as fantastic as they are because of influences they have from the from their country. It's it, it's everything about a giallo. It's not just the story, it's absolutely everything. It's down to the music, you know, whether it's someone like uh, Ennio Morricone or Fabio Frizi or Goblin doing it, you know, um, to the cinematography, like uh, Sergio, Sergio Salvati. Um, I'm going to pronounce that wrong. I can't, I can't pronounce Italian names very well. Um, <laughs> down to, like, the make. It's, it's everything. It's, it's a whole package for me with the, the Italian movies. And Giallo's especially are just, they're just great because, they, they're, you know, they have some interesting storylines. They have some really cool death scenes. They're very stylized, which is really cool. Yes. Um, and you know, there's not enough good things I could say about Giallis um, more than anything else. So I've watched them for a long time, but obviously yeah. leaned more in the past when I thought about making a movie, kind of along these lines of doing a slasher, because you know you, we don't live in that period anymore where you can make a Gialli. You know, there are filmmakers who are around that are making throwbacks, and that's cool. You know, um, I haven't watched it yet, actually. The, our mutual friend Guy, who who put me in touch with you, uh, recommended yeah. a film to me called the called the editor, which I haven't had. I've got a copy of it now, but I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. And I think that came out, I don't know, not that long ago, four, five, six years ago. And right. from the trailer, it looks very much like a like they're trying to make a pure jelly, you know, uh, from that time. And that's cool. Mm-hmm. But I didn't particularly want to do that um, because you know we don't live in that time anymore. I'm not shooting on film. Set's not going to look the same. We're not going to get the same type of music. You're just not going to create that atmosphere completely. Yeah. So I went more, leading more towards a style of a jelly inspired slasher film. So it's got aesthetically uh, the, the aesthetics of a jelly, but more leaning towards uh, you know what you would class like a slasher film. You know something like um like Halloween or Friday the Thirteenth or you know right. prom. You know stuff like that. Uh, yeah. But to answer your originally, original question, sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent. No, no, no. I, 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 that was really interesting because when you mentioned about, you know, being influenced but not a straight a straight Jalo film, I thought that was really interesting because you mentioned to me before about how maybe there's um the, these days a lot of people are trying to make 80s films but they feel out of place because we're not in the 80s. You know, they don't. Yeah. It, it does. It doesn't kind of match. And I thought that was a really interesting point. So no, I'm glad you've I'm glad you've explained that. Well, I think, yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, like we did talk previously, it's there's nothing wrong with having influences because we all have influences in life, like whether you're writing or directing or, or making music, whatever it is. But um, to want to just make exactly what you watch growing up, it's 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 nice because it's, um, 
you know, this n nostalgia feeling, but you're never going to be able to do it and never going to be able to pull it off because like, we, like we've already stated, you're not in that time period anymore. So you should use it as a base. And that's what yes. I've done with this, you know? So the, the, the two main, aesthetically, the two main influences for the Blade Cuts Deeper are Dario Argento's The Bird with the Crystal Plumage and Sergio Martino's uh, Torso. Uh, torso, not so much. It's more to do with how the killer looks. Although in Torso, he's wearing a balaclava, and we don't have a balaclava, but it's, it's, it's kind of taken some influence from there. Um, yeah, uh, but with Bird with the Crystal Plumage, you'll probably see at least two shots in there that are just like, oh, I can see where he's taking that from directly. <laughs> well, I mean, it, why, why not? I mean, ultimately... A lot of what we would call, I suppose, what people would say are tropes about Jalo. Often they're talking about things that were seen in Bird, Bird with a Crystal Plumage. That, that seems to be what people latch on to. Obviously, there's a literary history there. You know, the, these films have lasted, be it, well, no, the, the, the genres lasted before they were films in those, those yellow books that, that people used to buy, those little pulp novels. So the idea that, you know, in 2024, you know, we can see some really cool takes on that again with a modern feel. It is really exciting. I think it's really exciting. I was going to ask you about that, the visual side of it, because a lot of it is is very visual. Whether it's the way the kills happen, or the the black leather, or the motorcycle helmets, or whatever it is, the different through the hands, the, the the certain things that we used to see. Is that something that maybe? As your background, and maybe if you want to talk a little bit about this, your background in camera work and director of photography, cinematography, do you think those things just are linked intrinsically with Jalo? That's that's kind of the first thing that stands out is the way that they look. I think now, yeah, I, th <clears throat> I think so. Like you said, the bird with the crystal plumage is, I think, the one that really catapulted Jelly movies like worldwide they've been exported at that point but that was the one that really like brought people's attention to it and it was very stylized obviously from the get-go dario argento with his the way he was making movies um but yeah i think so i think definitely that's what people think of um not to say that we have these massive set pieces in our movie because it is a low budget film and we don't we didn't have the the budget that you know a lot of the even though those yeah. italian movies were considerably lower budget than the americans they still they were working with pretty decent budgets sometimes you'd be surprised to know like I was, I was reading a, reading a book recently, and um, although it's not a jelly, I was reading about uh, I think it was the Beyond, and I think it had something like a million dollars for yeah, a budget, which yeah. you know that's in like early eighties. That's still quite a decent amount of money to make a movie with. That's um, right, where... because there was those certain individuals, whether it was you know up in the hills with a massive house that they were also or a castle that doubled as a studio and throw money at people. Um, you know, th these are the these are the kind of things that. Sometimes we don't know where that money came from, but <laughs> but 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 yeah, it was they, they were getting that funding somehow, weren't they? And I suppose that's something I that we kind of pushed to one side, and um, we don't think that yeah, there was a lot of time and money spent on on a, quite a few of these for the time. Yeah, no, I, I'd say so, but um, uh, like with with the blade because deeper, so th there are some there are some quite stylized kills in certain ways but yeah there's nothing as big as what you would see in an argento film you know we there's a there is definitely a i'll just call it a somewhat unnecessary chase sequence in the movie that doesn't need to be there but it's very inspired by an argento film which is that sounds great because what happened was we we turned up on the last six days of filming so the the about the last um 40 minutes of the movie which is basically the last half of the film is set in one location it's in a production office for a, like a film production company and when we turned up to, when i went to scout the location where we we're going to film it uh the people said oh by the way this is this place underneath where we are right now so i went to look at it and it was a it was a half finished area that had been invested in but they couldn't get the rest of the money so it was just essentially a construction site and i looked at it and thought yeah i'm gonna have to do a chase sequence in here because it just it wouldn't make any sense really but it'll just look really good um so I just wrote a chase sequence into the movie, and then that and that happened. So there's some, there is that kind of uh, event in the film, and yeah, it, they are quite stylized. Some of the kills, um, and especially the camera angles, you know, the classic, you know, uh, low angle knife up in the air, you know, that kind of shot, um, you know, Amazing. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I love um, it. I love it. That that's so cool as well, because uh, like like we were saying, you obviously you're not just doing a shot for shot 
remake of a famous Jello film. This is very much a British take, your own take. It's filtered through all your influences. I, I was reading the synopsis and it made me really interested in watching it. And, and, and I, I, I don't say that lightly because often I can think of maybe like two or three films that I'm excited to see. Um, there's one at the moment um, that, that I can't wait to see is a Late Night with the Devil. I think that looks oh, yeah. like it's going to be really, really good. good. Yeah. Almost like um, King of Comedy or in The Joker or even in Seinfeld where there's those bits of, of like set up of, um, of a talk show and it's got that kind of 70s feel to it. Um, what what got what why that why that made me think about yours was that in yours there's a kind of um, a, a TV show lights camera kill and mm. this this host John Abbott I, I think that's a really good way of getting people in into this I, I love that kind of meta textual feel where you've got a, a show within a show a character who is. Uh, you know, making a TV show within the thing, whether it's something like Censor, and we see little clips from the films in Censor. I, I think people really uh, are attracted to, to things like that because it just shows that a, a little bit more thought's gone into the process of the writing. It's not just stalk and slash or walk and kill. There's this there's, there's character development. So tell me a little bit about the story if it, without giving too much away. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, well, no, definitely I didn't want to just, kind of be stalk and slash um oh just by the way you mentioned sense i just watched that for the first time a, a, a few nights ago and really enjoyed it it was a lot more serious than i thought it was going to be i thought mm. it was going to be more quirky horror but that was good i mean and i don't mean that in a bad way i really no. enjoyed it it was and it's always good to see michael smiley i'm a massive michael smiley fan. yeah he's great <laughs> he's isn't great, he isn't it, 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 yeah. for me i watched it around the same time as saint maud and i and i love saint maud i think it's one of the best um sort of British or Welsh, um, you know, fil film horrors. You know, there's, there's there's a few that I have on that list of, of, of recent ones, and certainly like Host and Saint Maud stand out. With Censor, I liked. I think I liked, and this is going to be a bit of a hot take. <laughs> um, like ninety percent of it, I wasn't that sold with the end and the saturation and the 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 Lynchian stuff at the end or, or, or whatever they were trying to. But, um. I, I definitely appreciated the idea behind it and a lot of the film. I thought it was excellent. And again, that talks a lot about the period of horror that I guess you and I and people who are into oh, horror yeah, are still fascinated nice with. Yeah. So, so yeah, what, what 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 helped you come up with the idea of lights, camera, kill? Because it's not. It wasn't right, Alan sorry, Partridge, yeah. was it? Um, <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't um, Smash Bang Wallet. What a what a video. Um. No, no, no. Sorry, I'll go back to the original question you asked me. Uh, yeah, so... Um, no, no, it's fine. So, so the story, yeah, the story centred around... Um, well, it's not centred... Yeah, I'm trying to think of this so I don't give too much away. So there's a TV show within the yeah. movie ca called Lights, Camera, Kill, and it's a true crime TV show. And like every true crime TV show, they have, you know, they'll the cover a, a real-life murder, although the murders that are TV show within the film covers are not real murders. We've made murders up um you know for the tv show so it gets a little complicated that way uh but uh yeah so we we've made up this tv show and there's always a reenactment section so lights camera kill they like to open up every episode with a reenactment of how the killer or killers whoever the you know the people are the covering the killers are the covering were caught so right. we the movie opens up with a story that they're doing on this particular episode and how the killer got caught and we we find out whilst watching the the opening that we're actually at a film festival and john abbott who is the presenter of the tv show uh, is a guest at the film festival and he's giving a sneak peek preview of the final episode of season one at the festival and hopes you know that people will spread the word uh, and that people will tune in more you know to watch it uh so but just so happens that at this festival one of the people who was very close to the victim uh in the reenactment is there watching it and he's not too impressed with how they portrayed kind of heroically portrayed the killer almost ah, and okay. and how they've dealt with his the this this person's um kind of loved one's death cool. as well so you know he decides to basically just go on a murder rampage <laughs> that, that is that is just so cool i can think of so many people where that just that those couple of sentences they're like i'm in i'm in what what part of, of it do you think is in, influenced by the Britishness of what you're what you're doing? Because obviously we've talked about those yellow tropes and 
I love Shallow. We all love it. But what what do you think makes it um, uniquely British? Obviously, it, it's filmed in Britain with British, <laughs> um, predominantly British cast. So I'd imagine that's part of it. But what what is it that, in terms of story wise or anything about it, that you think melds those things together? I think it's. I mean, it's probably the mentality of the people who who work together on that show and how I can't. It's difficult again to say because I'll, I give some kind of character development way, but how basically ah. they just um, deal with things in a very British way. You know, that, that's the easiest way for me to me to say it uh, without giving too much away. Um, yeah, we only have there's only one person in the movie who wasn't Brit. Uh, oh no, that's wrong. Actually, there are two people in the movie who aren't British. There's Kristen who plays the character of Olivia, uh, but she lives in England now. She's originally from Norway, and actually, whilst while she's in the movie, there's a part in the movie where she has a phone call uh with her what is her cousin although that's never stated but in the script it was it's her cousin she's having a phone call with and i thought you know what she, you know i'm making a jelly movie they used to put they basically used to throw in a bunch of people from different countries and scenes and they would all speak yes. different language um we didn't do that but i thought you know what i've got someone she's from norway she's obviously fluent in norwegian she's fluent in english i thought you know what we'll just we'll do this home fo whole phone call in norwegian and i'll just get uh, some foreign language in there as well because i thought that'd be cool to have and that also, is real yeah that is really it's cool also because it's, you know it's, it's it's a phone call as well it's not it's 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 necessary dialogue that people need yeah. to understand to kind of help but at the same time it's not you know it's just it's a bit of dialogue about what's going on so it's a bit you know um yeah. so I thought, that makes perfect it, sense though um because in yeah. the in in a lot of jello the british actor or the american actor is the interloper and uh, you know it, it's, it's whether it's michael brandon or whether it's you know um john saxon popping up every yeah, five minutes course, or yeah. whoever it is the, these people just appear and they almost it's quite interesting really but you're right a lot of the times it's mainly phone calls with people back home or conversations with people within in, in the within the film i guess for time they often just assimilate into the culture really fast <laughs> just like well, yeah, straight into it but actually you need that background don't you that that, that, that there is um, a person out of place here or, or maybe dealing with the situation differently because it's not there I'm, I'm trying to think of the george lazenby one where um his he, he's trying to solve the crime and oh he's is that kind of whatever happens to solange it might be, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and he's... another one you mean, yeah. It's in the streets of Venice, isn't it? I'm sure it's in yeah. Venice, yeah, around the canal. Because he feels yeah, yeah. really confused and out of time, and yeah. like that—that's the only one that stands out for me. Where it, 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 I can think of other films, obviously, but not necessarily uh, Jolly films. But like, say, you that feeling that um, like frantic, like Harrison Ford, or you know, it's like, where's my wife? There's so many like oh, that, yeah. and I think that's the scary part of it is being out of place um so this is almost switched you've got a predominantly british <laughs> character cast with a, with one or two interlopers from different cultures as well that's right the, the other person is is uh, is my is the uh, quentin uh, who plays the character of noah and he's a security guard at the production company it's, it, it's his first night working at the production company he, and quentin's from texas so you know um and as john abbott is uh hmm. Not a very nice person. I was going to say another word, which is used about him in the movie. Well, you can do. Feel so. free. Feel free. I well, probably use similar all the time. So, uh, so uh, I won't, people, I won't yeah. censor you. <laughs> people don't like him. Um, so a, a moment John Abbott meets him, he's just giving him shit already because he's American. That's the type of person John Abbott is. So, you know, right. uh, no one likes him. No one likes him. But they all work with him because, you know, he, he gives them work and... They He's the no Edmonds of the uh, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, he allows them to do the work that they all want to do, which is work in TV or, or technically it's a, it's a streaming show that they have. But you know, he treats it as if it's a t as an old school TV show because I think he still living a little bit in the past. Uh, right. But yeah, yeah, okay. it's it, it, in, in regards to being very British. It's not. I wouldn't say that. It's it's quite it's quite open. Uh, maybe the attitudes of the way some people deal with things are quite British. But apart from that, it's quite an open. Uh, story. I think a lot of people can relate to it because it's about how people are treated at work as well, um, which okay. you know everyone can relate to in some way. So, um, oh, 100%. yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, obviously, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's little bits in the there's little bits in the character of Abbott that you know we've put in that we've had dealings with with 
previous bosses and we think well yeah that that would oh, suit going nice. in there you know so, <laughs> so, so yeah work that's there. it that, that that's how we that's how we get these things out as well i think um you know we say when people say right write what you know it, it, it it's a cliche but actually in terms of how you do that is very nuanced and and it, and it feels genuine and real and and lived if you do write about experiences that you have because it's really hard yeah. to to it's really hard to kind of get that across unless you've been through it. It's sometimes you know the phrase when people say they don't know they're born. I always think well, when I'm when I'm working with people and someone goes, Oh, well, they don't know what it was like 10 years ago. It was like this, this, and this. They go, Well, I go, Yeah, they literally don't know. The, 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 it's out of their realm of understanding and, ex, and experience. Therefore, you it doesn't matter what you say, <laughs> they're not gonna get that. Whereas in a film, you can see it. So it's genuine. Your, your, your characters are showing those things. So I love that, that there's like some real um, horrible bosses in there, some real pains in the backside you know, you've had to deal with. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 yeah, collectively, that, that's a good way of dealing with it. So um, in terms of your coming towards this film and, and, be, and, and directing this film, you, you've obviously been involved in a lot of um, other projects over the last, particularly over the last few years, in, in terms of cinematography or production, or or, or even um, work, working on on different things, how? Just tell me a little bit about your background and how you got to the point of making the blade cuts deeper, because I imagine it, it was like a step by step process. Yeah, no. Well, I started out as a camera operator for a production company that dealt mainly in market research so really sexy stuff you know um <laughs> that was for car i mean i enjoyed the job because it was for car manufacturers and we were the, the setup basically would be they would get members of the public in bring them in look at a car that's going to be out say five to ten years get them to walk around and model of the car sit them down in the room talk about it see what they like and didn't like about it you know just normal market research stuff and, and we filmed it but with that you know we got to travel all over the world doing that so that was a pretty cool part of the job that, that sounds um, a bit like um sorry to interrupt but i was just thinking as you're saying now it's not very sexy and all this guy i was just thinking you know think about george romero making adverts and, and you know and, and doing and doing public information and things like that so maybe you're the uh the uk george romero you know <laughs> yeah. well I, my glasses are getting bigger and bigger all the time so maybe <laughs> same um... <laughs> same <laughs> but yeah i started out doing corporate stuff like that and then uh, moved into doing you know, like like uh, George Romero Industrials and things like that, and you know, com uh, doing some commercial work, um, and then took a bit of a break and went out the country for a little bit to live away, to live out the country, and and did some work whilst I was away. Uh, then came back in 2016 and got back into doing filming again, but was again was doing more corporate stuff. And then 2018, I thought, oh, I've, you know, I've always my dream's always been to make a movie. I've been writing movies since I was a teenager, scripts. I just like writing anyway. Um, yeah. And I've always wanted to make a movie, but I never really had the maturity, I think, when I was a little bit younger to, to make it. And uh, mostly the maturity to deal with people in making the movie because, you know, you're on, you're only making the movie, filming it. for Like, uh, Blake Cuts Deeper was a 14-day shoot. It's a very short shoot for a movie, but when you haven't got a lot of money, you've got to, you know, squeeze out as much as you can in, in, in a short amount of days. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but the movie's, we started writing the movie in what September 2021 and it's almost finished now. It's going to be, it should be delivered around May this year to me. Uh, it's in post-production sound right now and the, and the scores just in the final bit, a bit of uh, working on it. Um, yeah. So it's been a while. So, but um, sorry, my point is that uh, I don't think like that even when you're on 14 days on set, you need the maturity, especially as a director to you know deal with all the people because you're constantly being battered with questions by all the different departments you're working with and not that we had massive amounts of departments because obviously again it's a small budget but you've got camera you've got sound you've got makeup you might even have because um you know because i was i'm a producer but i brought in a line producer when when we were on set so even beforehand you know you know, things like selling applications and, you know all this information and, and having the maturity to deal with people and talk to people on set and beforehand pre-production if i'm honest I, I definitely didn't have that when i was in my in my twenties, uh, and then it took oh. in my thirties, living away to kind of grow up a little bit, and then come back, and then realize, okay, I can do this now. So I always had ideas, but being able to bring people together 
and do it. Um, and also, I hadn't really had that much experience on film, film sets. You know, it would be like corporate or commercial projects. Mm-hmm. So, I is there a major and... difference between them, or do you think? Do you oh, feel yeah. like you were you were you were learning your trade just in a different different way? Oh well, yeah, there's parts of it. Sure, I mean, sure, there's parts of it because even even with the commercials and corporate stuff, you can you can do a lot of great great work uh, visually and, and learn a lot of stuff. You know, whilst you're working in the camera department, and I learned a lot of stuff um, working with the uh, like in the sound department, and because you have all a lot of similar departments, so it's you learn a lot of the lingo, which is helpful when you get on set to make a movie because you can make things move quicker. You know, while you're making it, which is good, and also understand a, a little bit of their process. As well, which is good because you can communicate easier. You know, not I would never call myself a um, a master of any particular department. Maybe obviously more camera department, but you know, I know little bits from here and there, which is very helpful, especially if you're directing a movie, just to communicate and get things across easier. So you don't have to spend too long having a conversation about what you want. But yeah, there's you know there's, there's similarities, but there's also big differences as well. Um, but yeah, so that that's it. And then 2018. I started a company called Barber Green Digital, which um, and then we were doing work with charities and social enterprises. And then I had some money left over that was meant to be a salary for me for a job I'd done for some of these charities and social enterprises. And I thought, well, you know what? I've got this short film. I've always wanted to do a narrative. I'll make a short film. So I did that, and that short film is actually where I started the relationship with my. My, the DP I use on my films because I don't really want to be the DP on my own movies. It's it's enough directing on set to have to worry too much about yeah. all the other things as well. And then I met um, um so his name's Paul Olavis, and then I met my sound guy whose name's John Meller, who's worked on everything with me since I did my very first short film. Um, and then pretty much a lot of the other people who worked on the feature I've met on my short film, far a few others. I, that we had to bring in because we had a little bit more of a budget than we did in the short film for the feature so we could have a couple of extra people that I wouldn't normally have. Um, so yeah, I started making shorts about 2018, made two shorts. Um, one played in a couple of festivals, the other one played in one festival. Didn't Wasn't really using them to get me work. The shorts were really, okay, I know how to do industrial, I know how to do uh, commercial stuff, corporate stuff. The short films were kind of my film school for how to make narrative pieces. Right. So that's what they were re- they were really good for. And then, like I said, I started writing The Blade Cuts Deeper, um, which I think it had another title. It might have just been called Lights, Camera, Kill, the short film. I can't right. remember, to be honest. I'd have to look at the script. It's somewhere. Uh, but it wasn't called The Blade Cuts Deeper. Um, and we started writing that. I started writing that with my friend Alex. And then it just spiraled into more and more pages and i thought well i couldn't i could make i could condense this into a short but you know what i've made two short films i feel like i've these are what the, the two, my t- first two short films taught me the first short film taught me how to budget and how to um uh how to schedule which is really important the second short film i did was the first short film was si- uh, cr- crime second short film was horror and that taught me how to work well with a uh, makeup effects department because I always wanted to use practical makeup effects if I was going to do a horror movie so that right. taught me how to do that so then I came well I've got the feature now I know how to budget I know how to schedule things I'm good at finding locations I've got a good script I know how to talk to all the different departments now I know what I want visually because you know I, I mean it may be enough that you just love movies and you and you could go because I remember Quentin Tarantino said once something along the lines of um you know, if you really, really love movies that much, you can't help but make a good movie. And I think that's true if your mm-hmm. first movie has like a million or two million dollar budget and you've got professionals working in all the other departments. But when yes. you're working with a low budget like us and OK, you may love movies, you still, you know, need to have a level of skill yourself yes. or background in it just so that you can um, you're not relying purely on all the other people that have. A background in it but you know haven't been doing it for that long so you can help yeah you basically if, it's your, if, you, if it's your vision you know uh, in any realm you want to be skilled enough to be able to kind of literally direct those things so that the, what, what comes out on screen is what you had in your mind originally and sometimes that takes going away and learning a new skill or learning or, or improving a certain skill I really enjoyed the. I know you, you sent me um, the trailer, and I I really enjoyed it the way it was shot and the the, the way it was put together. And obviously, I've read the synopsis as well. Um, 
it, it feels very considered and thought out. Yeah. Um, and and that that doesn't I don't think that takes away from any creativity. You know, like you were saying, if people are like, oh just just make, go and make a film, go make a film. Loads of people do that, but do we consume those films and come back to them? We might do in a kind of watching a a bad movie kind of way and having lots of fun with it, which I love to do. And I, and I don't really mean bad because it's just a different type of movie, I guess. Um, but when you're trying to make something with love. <laughs> it's different isn't it and i think that yeah you know yeah. what 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 part of that came from the short so like I, I was having a look through um and another great title by the way um death is the keeper of secrets that feels very uh so that is great. actually that is actually a line from sergio martino's torso when the killer's walking right. up the stairs at the end he's whispering to himself Right, and I thought that's a cool fucking line. I want to, I want to take the movie. Yeah, man, I love it. I love it. I, I think, I think as you go, I think every film you make, you should add another two words onto the title so that we get, we literally get <laughs> your, you know, your, uh, your window is the key to the soul of the death of the lung, and, da, 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 da. <laughs> and then we, well, we're well, like, people are looking and go, that's definitely a jello. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, right? So the the. My first, my two shorts. One's called "Death Is the Keeper of Secrets," and the other one called um, "Death Is Not a Whisper." And I thought, well, I should make it a trilogy. And the next thing I make, I wanted to call "Death Strikes at Midnight," which was a title I was considering for this film. But I thought, no, that, that's for my short. If I do another yeah. short, this is. Oh, I think the blade no. goes deeper because the blade, the blade itself as an instrument, is instantly tied in with with Jalo and and tied oh, in yeah. with Italian film. I think that you know just from whether it's slicing of an eyeball or, you know, all those things that make you go, the oh, idea yeah. of a of a blade and the clinical side of a blade coming near human anatomy is, 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 is so scary, isn't it? It's just, uh, it's just one of those things where your body reacts to it more than your, your mind. It's a kind of just a instant reaction. Do you, do you, um, did, did you consider that so you talked about practical effects is, is practical effects something that excites you about about filmmaking oh yeah because um when i was younger i used to watch um what well, when i could when you could find documentaries or, or find behind the scenes footage and i was always influenced always a big fan of tom savini you know i've got his right. book it's actually right just there on the shelf of the grand illusions <laughs> um and uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of practical effects. I always, I kind of wanted to be to do practical, like, be a makeup artist when I was younger, but I'm terrible at drawing and I can't sculpt for shit. Same. Um, and so it wasn't really an option. And then I then I lean more towards cinematography because I, I'm you know just I, I liked photography when I was younger and I, I like the idea of being a cinematographer. So I, I lean more towards that and just started writing as well. The exciting side of, of of you know whether it is cutting something with a someone with a blade oh, yeah, or yeah. A, or the visual <clears throat> the visual I suppose is a visual is a visual effect but the practical side of it getting your hands dirty and and trying these things and working with different people I guess th yeah. that helps helps in a low budget to a certain degree you have certain limits that you can work and you can't just be like oh well I'll buy this thing that costs thousands and thousands of pounds and to make it work. So, so how, talk, talk to me a little bit about that—the sort of the practical side of things. You know how you got the the, the practical effects going, essentially. How, yeah, how you no, got them working sure. without giving without giving away any specifics, I suppose. That's a, <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I mean, I've got nothing against visual effects. In fact, I've got uh, a bit, guy who, again, who introduced me to you. Yeah, um, of course. Yeah, so he's he's a visual effects artist. He's working on my movie now because there's some there are stuff that he's doing on the movie, but predominantly a lot of the kills were, are all practical. So. One of the death scenes in the, you know, again, there's a lot of POV stuff in this because it's jelly influenced. Um, so, you know, uh, Argento apparently was famous for doing whenever you'd see like a hand come into shot from the killer's point of view, it might be his gloved hand. Well, there are, yes. there are a couple of shots of, in this movie that are my gloved hand, and one, one of them, one of the particular fun ones that I got to do was one of the death scenes, which I can show you in the scenes video, you'll see that particular death.
name is uh, Eric. I'm second AC on this set, um, as you can see. I'm, for those who don't know, I do this. It's kind of cool, you know, it's kind of a cool film. Um, first thing, first reason why I came on was because I know the director Gene. I've known him for the past year um, through the connections that you and I have as well, Rehan. We met through him through that and I've just stayed in contact with him and he said he was working on a horror kind of um, film and it sounded cool and then I link to yeah, the website okay. in the description yeah there's a bit in the movie where the character of olivia dies it's pretty obvious from the, the behind the scenes footage that she's gonna die <laughs> you, you see that in the behind the scenes so she actually gets she gets killed very very gra very graphic her death and i was i was the one who gets to do it because it was a point of view so i thought i'm gonna do this so this is i've got it up here it's just it looked at me as i sleep which is i guess a bit creepy um but this is this is a cast of uh so the actress's name, her name is Kristen. She played the character of Olivia, and this this is her this is her face after she's killed in the movie. So let's see if I can get this for you. Oh wow! Oh, that's so cool. So obviously she uh, had the, the, there was there was a wig that went on wig that went on. Yeah, this, but, uh, I know. Yeah. I, I love that. That's great. <laughs> so yeah, so um, it was. I I think I stabbed it about thirty or forty times with the knife. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's something that you need. Yeah, you definitely need to be. Uh, that that doesn't go in the bin afterwards. That's that's a piece of no, your no. Of, of your history. It's actually the second severed head I have up, up on that cabinet because my first short film, I had another actor's head cast um, uh, for for the story, and um, his head had been chopped off with a machete and had a couple of machete slices in his in his in his. Uh, on his wow. head, like see chunks. So that's up there. That's actually in a box because um, my son has friends over sometimes, and one one of his friends saw it and got scared. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious! Oh, yeah, explaining that one is quite an interesting uh, conversation, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so Sorry, yeah, no, I love I love practical really cool. effects. I, I want the practical. I want practical effects in the movie. It's just fun on set, you know, working with them. And like I said. Working on that second short taught me how to work with the practical effects department and not just how to communicate with them, but also like going back to scheduling again, knowing how long you need to give your makeup guys and gals to, to do what they need to do. Because, you know, I've been on sets for some low budget horror and they get there and like, oh, you got two hours and they got and they're like, well, we need at least four hours to put all these appliances right. on. And, you know, yeah. so, you know, I found all that out. So we had two the last two days. Um, was it like well one night was different because one of the actors had to leave but last two days of the shoot uh for three of the death scenes were just purely makeup effects we shot all the bits around the scene and then we just spent the last two days actually doing the makeup effects we had lots of time for applying them and like making sure the effects were working and things like that so it's just lots of fun it, it's oh just, yeah well you know, that's it and, and, and i guess the thing is i mean i i was recently watching event horizon and i think that's an incredible film and that's even fantastic. though yeah, there's some, there's some, um, <laughs> you know, obviously there's some CGI and things like, uh, but there's also some practical, and, and I guess it's it's that melding and carefully, you know, you talk about Guy and the, and the things Guy's done, and he's done so many great, you know, um, pieces of um, a, a, of work in visual effects. 
you'd be kind of naive to think that a, a successful film doesn't have all of the tools in your toolkit in it. Yeah. Um, and that's that's kind of what makes I think what why I'm excited about your film. And the more I talk to you as well, is that kind of idea of you've obviously done the the back ground in learning your craft and your trade so that these things can work <laughs> rather than like you oh, say yeah. turning up on the day and going i don't think this can work we, we gave ourselves an hour to do it it would take four or five hours let's just leave it out <laughs> yeah no it's good i mean that's it and the other thing the other big thing i learned about being a director is uh, especially at this level it may be different at the higher budget levels i mean it, it probably won't be in certain respects but you know that um is compromise like the amount of yeah. compromises you have to make because you've you've planned all these things and you've got everything you need but then you get there and something happens and because money simply buys you more time on set and we you we don't have a, an abundance of money you know you're like well we've got to compromise now and you've got to be able to just switch something in your head and make a decision and um i mean you could you you should have some kind of plan b's and plan c's anyway just in case for what you think may happen but Sometimes things yes. pop up that you just don't realize, so you just you just gotta come up with stuff on the spot. But I I went into this feature film, and you know this is this is not this doesn't seem like I had high hopes, but I went into this feature film thinking we got fourteen days on this budget, I'll be happy if I get fifty percent of what I want, and then I watched the, the um I watched the first cut of the film, and I was like oh shit I got about oh, at least 80%. And then as the cuts have gone on, I'm like, oh, I've got more. This is great. So we had to yeah. do one pickup day on the movie because I watched the first cut back and thought, well, oh, we there's a death implied in that bit. But you know what? I don't want to see the death, but I'd want to see I want to see the aftermath of the death. So we went back to the location and just oh, shot cool. an insert essentially. But um but then it took and we were sitting there and this the actor needed to have all these puncture marks put over a face which took ages and um which is fine but that's good because you, you need time again to do it and we've got a really nice shot of her just lying dead with it showing showing um she gets she gets stabbed to death in the face i've got a lot of stabbings in the face in this movie i don't know why um <laughs> this one this this one was with a screwdriver though not with a knife so, so it's variety <laughs> there's, yeah there's, 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 there's variety, there's a variety there. yeah. yeah yeah obviously if i put a link to the a website that's the best place to find out information about when it when when the release and when when we can get to see it and how we can get to see it well there is a facebook page as well to be honest it hasn't been updated okay. in a while uh, because i just started concentrating on the edit of the movie um yes. and then been working on all the post-production all the different departments getting the film finished uh, so i should i should update the facebook website because I, I was the one running that um but yeah there is a facebook uh page as well which i think would probably be a better place to go although the website states at the moment is in post-production which it is and we'll update the, the, the status of it once um it's finished and i've just signed off yesterday on a song that's going to get to be used in the movie so i'll probably end up putting that on the on the web on the page on the uh, on the website as well um and the trailer will the trailer will be the trailer still needs grading so once it's graded that'll go up on the website and uh, any announce any big announcements will probably be on the main page of the website, such as like release dates or festival dates, because we're we're looking to go to festivals first before you know doing anything oh, yeah. else. You know, I'm looking I'm looking forward to that. Um, you know, to to getting getting to hear about how it go, you know how how it gets re received and you know um, where you go with the film and and I I just can't wait to see it myself. And I know that looking on um, your IMDb. There's um, a mention of um, an in-production film as well, Body Horror. Oh yeah, so that's a that's a hor it's a hor it's a feature film. It's an anthology movie that I'm working on with a company from I think they're based in Cardiff. I'm sure they're based in Cardiff. Uh, called Hellbound Media. They they background is in comic books, but they they're branching out into movies. So they con they contacted me and um doing the cinematography for the whole for every segment of the anthology the wraparound uh, section and all the all the all of the that. sections and i'm meant to be directing one of the shorts but we'll see how that goes maybe maybe it happens maybe it doesn't but i'm doing the cinematography for the whole thing anyway so we we've, we've shot some i mean that's a beautiful thing about making an anthology movie as well you don't have to shoot it all in like 30 days you know they're all separate yeah, stories 
So um, we've shot. It's like how Abaca sat it down to the an absolute science, didn't they? And you know, basically out of a shed. Um, <laughs> so you're like, yeah, it's um, it, it's great. And they're so. I think actually they play better now than they ever did because we have. I'm not going to say we all have short shorter attention spans, but we quite like an episodic approach to things. Um, yeah. So it it works really it works really well. I mean, I don't know. It, so we talk about trends, and I get like little email up, updates of things from YouTube, and sometimes they were like, "Oh well, everyone's watching shorts, and you need to be doing shorts and people's attention spans." But then actually, when you look at it, and I, and I am no expert because I'm very old and very out of touch, but um, one of the the things I was reading about TikTok is that they're moving towards longer form um, content because people are ready for it. So it's kind of cyclical. Um, <laughs> and I, I think what it comes down to is the quality and interest of it. So I'm excited to hear to hear more about the um, the anthology side of body horror. But, you know, the, 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 the blade cuts deeper is your baby, isn't it? That's the one that we all want everybody to go out and see and find uh, more information about. Yeah, well, I mean, I, it's, as much horror as possible, really, because, you know, we should be supporting all the British horror that we can because, yes. there, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in England in the low-budget side. It's just It's a shame it just doesn't have more money pumped into it, you know, with the funding. Uh, there's, there's funding... There's funding available from private people or, or people doing things like uh, you know, like crowdfunding stuff like that. Um, but we don't have any. We don't really have the BFI or places like that going out of their way to fund to fund horror. No, I think I think they horror. do completion. I think they do completion funding maybe, but I don't think they. Yes. I don't think you can go there. and say, "Look, hey, I want to stab someone in the face thirty <laughs> times. Can you give me some money?" <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, they um, they rebadge it when it when they think it's going to do well um basically yeah oh so, yeah so so um, yeah, yeah i would lo i'd love people to go and and keep track of the blade cuts deeper and you know keep out of it when uh look out for when it comes out but you know there's there's like body horror movie which i, I think that's just a title they go with the moment that's not the final title of the movie and then there's um uh there's another one i'm blanking on right now there's, well there's another film we were meant to start shooting in may but i think it's been pushed back to september now i, I don't think i can say anything about it but it's right it's it's set in liverpool and so which is local to me so that i'm, I'm going to be the cinematographer on that one uh, but like directing wise um I've, I've got a couple of scripts i'm working on right now but it's more just it's trying to find the funding more than anything because yes. i've i've I found funding for this and i put some of my own money up for it because it just you know when nobody knows who you are you have to do that no one yeah. you know people just because you have a great idea you see you hear all these amazing stories from hollywood like oh he had this amazing script and he got offered it and you're like nah, it doesn't work that way you know you could have a really good idea an amazing script but you've never made a move before people are very reluctant to give you money so you're just going to have to put your money where your mouth is and <laughs> do it yourself really well that, that, i found it really interesting um, my first interview that i did was with jed shepherd and he gave me a real well, listen to that one of, Oh, good. Oh, I hope you liked it. I thought it was it was it was fascinating chap, and he gave me a real understanding of that the funding side. And to be honest, he's the kind of person that I would want uh, in charge of galvanizing the British in film industry. And um, yeah, exactly. and then on on top of that, you you know, I've I've met people there. Uh, Jason Brown, who's just finished um, Creek Encounters in Nottingham, and you know, he he he's, he he. I remember him. What really stood out for me, telling me about being on a similar course to Shane Meadows, but now those those courses aren't available for young filmmakers and they can't follow those paths. And I, I, I was, I was, it was really frustrating. So like that's, that was the, basically the intention behind this channel, like I said to you before. Um, and obviously speaking to Guy, uh, Guy Pearson, who works in, you know, for so many, so many films he's done, he's worked with and, and, and kind of supported other people as well. And um, such a great guy and a supporter of this channel. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think you know when we're talking about all these creative, wonderful people in Britain, you're you're you're, you're dead straight when you say you know if we can support and discuss and share and help each other out, then that's the way forward, isn't it? It's that kind of idea of not just keeping it to yourself and uh, uh, like uh, protecting your own little bubble, but actually saying oh have you checked out this film have you checked out this this creator um uh, so 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 have you found 
that, that you, you, predominantly your experiences have been positive with other filmmakers and other creators? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I like recently I met a guy named Charlie Steeds. I don't know if you know his films. You know, he makes on average, it seems about two movies a year working in the micro budget level. And, um, you know, I've seen quite a few of his movies. They did a screening of one of his films kind of locally to me and he was there. So I just went there and met him. And introduced myself and said, you know, I've just made a movie. I was talking to him. And he's a really nice person. He gave me a lot of advice about, you know, sales agents and distributors because I'd, I've never had to deal with that before. So, yeah, there yeah. are a lot of nice people out there. You go talk to them and you just tell them what you're doing and they want to help. And, yeah, of mm-hmm. course, there are other people that you talk to and there's a little bit of competition or they think that maybe you're impeding on their territory or something like that. And, and you know, <laughs> But, and, but there's always going to be people, be people like that, no matter what. There is in every profession. In. Yeah, that's yeah, just so. that's just the way it is. And I guess as well, like film festivals and things like that, that there's sometimes you go to certain ones and the atmosphere is so supportive, and you're just meeting people and having a drink and getting to know them. I I, I really enjoyed the ones. The best ones I went to were like, um, obviously, I didn't have a film to to sell, so it was even better. Um, uh, but was um was, was the when they, they used to do the Starburst um film festivals in in Manchester because there was such a range of of established and new creators, but it was just very very everybody was on the same level just chatting about film and and taking you know details and get get sharing ideas. Um, I, I get I guess as well the online version of that is things like Film Freeway and sharing and, yeah. and sending things out and, and finding all the free ones. Is there any advice you, you would give to people who are wanting to do, you know, make make their own horror film? Is there something that you would say is the really important that you would share um, yeah. with them? You, you don't need a red or an ARRI camera to make a movie. I'll get that across right now. I'll tell you. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm not, I'm, it's, it's really bizarre because as a cinematographer, like I've talked to people and they're like, oh, well, you should come and do the movie with us. And then I tell them, well, I don't, you know, traditionally anyway, people, DPs never really had their own cameras traditionally, but then that was with 35 millimeter film. So you can understand cameras are a bit more affordable nowadays. But once, once um, people find out that I'm not shooting with a red or an Ari, they're like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's not going to be top quality. It's not Netflix approved. I'm like, well, first of all, is your film being financed by Netflix? No. So they don't give a shit. If your film's good and it plays festivals and people care, they'll take your movie anyway. That Netflix approved list, I think, I'm pretty sure it's only for if they're financing your film. That's what that that list is for. Yeah, because there's all kinds of things pop up on Netflix and Tubi and Prime of all various qualities. (laughs) Yeah, so so you don't need you don't need the greatest equipment to make a movie. What you need is just is obviously some passion, some knowledge of cinema. Obviously, obviously helps. And 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 do what you go in the direction that you want to make you know i see a lot of people starting off especially in film school and they start with some kind of serious drama or it's always something about mental health and like well you know those are serious subjects and there's nothing wrong with making people aware about that but is it really what you want to be doing there's nothing wrong with turning around and saying you know what i just want to kill someone in a movie and it's going to be yeah. fun and there's a like, story well, yeah, to go along with yeah, it yeah fun, so fun yeah it doesn't have to be a sort of like people will say like a poverty porn kind of film or a film that you think finance people will enjoy or um if you're really not into costume dramas then don't make a costume drama like i I can't imagine anything worse than sitting down and watching pride and prejudice or whatever it just doesn't (laughs) just, just doesn't do it for me i know there are people who love that but if i was to make a film i would want it to be fun like like basket case or you know something you know like Something yeah, no, that, I, that is just 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 um, gets me excited and, and, and makes me laugh, you know. I'm, I'm, but then again, I've always been. I don't know. Maybe people are turning around to this. Maybe you'll have an opinion on this. But like years and years ago, I used to always be like, "Oh, I love Halloween three. It's silly. It's over the top. It's crazy. It, it doesn't make any that. sense." But I love the music, the characters, the it's quotable. It's my favorite of the thing. And people just be like. What are you talking about? It's rubbish. No, it's a, now it's people game. are more excited, aren't they, about films like that? More excited about the yeah. fun side of film. Yeah, I mean, well, I've, I mean, apparently, I think from what I've read, John Carpenter wanted to make every Halloween movie different, so it'd be like maybe like anthology movies. 
But then obviously the first one was very popular, so they had to stick with Michael Myers. But no, Halloween Three is ace. It's, that's a great film. It's the robot. Yeah. <laughs> the robot thing. It's a great I'm, I'm hoping people come around to these things, you know, more now and kind of. We need films that are genuinely entertaining. You know, I, I don't want to see. This is why I kind of switched off to a lot of modern films and so very, very dark, grey, sort of just nothing really happening, just wandering around a house. You know, like if I want to see Belial, I want to see blades cutting deeper. I want to see people stabbing <laughs> people in their heads with um, screwdrivers. These things are fun and exciting and, and it, it's really cool that you're doing that you're following that it sounds like to even be saying you've made 80 percent of the film you wanted to make makes me think that you're a perfectionist and i can't wait to see what happened <laughs> well i i mean like i, I grew up watching um, like my favorite movie uh, the best movie i've ever seen is the texas chainsaw massacre i just think it's the greatest film i've ever seen it's a fantastic movie um you know low budget by standards but still bigger budget than what i had to work with um and then also, you know, movies like uh, like Brain Dead, you know, something like that, or yeah. Bad Taste, you know, it's, you know, just kind of stupidly fun. Evil Dead, you know, gory, or maybe Evil Dead is gory, but not as gory as what people consider gory nowadays. But at the time, gory, over the top, ridiculous, but a lot of fun and very creative, very inventive with you know its its camera movements and all that. That's it. It's the inventive. Inventive is I think is the key word, isn't it? When you see something yeah. you've not you've not seen before. Is often not always dependent on budget, is it? You know, it's it's dependent on working to those limitations and having that creative, the, that creative spark, I guess, and just just being passionate about what you do. Oh, completely. I mean, I'm a massive fan of found footage movies, and and you know, a lot of them aren't great, but that's fine because you can you can pick any genre or subgenre of movies, and maybe a lot of them aren't great, but you get a few really good ones. But I. You know, I'll always watch found footage movies because I just like the idea of them. I think it's a great idea, found footage movies. Yeah. Like I watched Dashcam quite recently. Mm. And I really like that. But I know it, was, it was strange because I went online and I'm reading, not reviews, but just kind of seeing general things that people saying about it. And they're talking about the main character in Dashcam. Yes. And saying that that was the worst thing for them. It's like quite annoying. But I thought, I thought her character was perfect. I thought that's exactly that type of character is exactly what that movie needed. And I really liked their character a lot. And I thought I was talking yeah. to guy cause he did the visual effects for it. And I'd be like, and I'm trying to, he's telling me what was practical and what was real. And I was like, I couldn't even tell, you know, his, his, his work oh. is so good. I it was really, was really good in that sense. Yeah. Particularly with that's, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I, I think when, um, when I talked to, to Jed, um, the, the, the intention was to make something less accessible than host like like a deliberate attempt yeah. to do something the like a 360 degree um or 180 oh my maths is terrible but a big change <laughs> to, to to the first one in the sense of or oh, not the first one but it's a host and and say we're gonna throw a lot of interesting wild stuff at you here can you take it can you take this personality of this character who can you take this what the some of the things you're gonna see can you you know I, I think that was a really brave piece of filmmaking and i kind of only got it after listening to people talk about it and again the reviews didn't reflect what i saw and actually i think like we need challenging characters in films um because it's not boring <laughs> it was just great. I mean, that, no, a character honestly was perfect for it because it it drove the decisions where the movie went perfectly. Yeah, and that yeah, everything sure. happened because she made those decisions because of who she was, and that's how, why it worked. Another type of character yes. making those same decisions or moving the movie in the direction that obviously they wanted it to go in, it, it wouldn't have worked. So I, no, I really like Dashcam a lot. That's one. You know, again, it's fun. I mean, it is. It's classed as a found footage movie, I guess, right? Although it, it's mm. not essentially because it's more like live streaming, isn't it? That she's live streaming. Yeah, yeah. And again, I mean, but, it's it's so unique, whatever, isn't it? Yeah, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's it's it's. You come across a movie. Um, I'm a bit late. It came out a couple of years ago. I came across no, it <clears throat> only recently. Watched it. 
and I, I loved it. I, I really liked it a lot. So I've I haven't seen Host yet. So based on dash cam, I'm going to go and watch Host now. Host is the film that really got me into sort of modern Brit- watching modern British horror films again because I've always been like a Hammer and Amicus and and further back, you know, the kind of kind of person and maybe some you know, video nasties from the eighties, but. <laughs> But really, um, Host was the one for me that's like a it's like a ten out of ten film for me. I just think it's a wonderful film. So, uh, and it was just so nice of, uh, again, like to to be able to talk to the writer of it and kind of get all that information because just as a as a film geek, um, it's it's fun to hear these things. Are like just oh yeah, sit, talking to you today I, it makes me much more excited. I was already really wanted to watch it just just from literally just all you had to say to me was british yellow and i was like i'm in but <laughs> everything that you've told me today i'm really interested in seeing it now and and hopefully you know people will watch this and go i'm in as well um i'm going to post all the links on, in the in the description and hopefully we can have a chat again in the future about how how everything went with the the the, the release of the film and the festivals um, or even we just talk about y- your choices of films that you love to watch, or you educate me on some shallows that I've not seen. <laughs> so that would be amazing. Or even on the scores or the, the um, directors of photography whose names I don't know. So these are all going to be, um, yeah, uh, hopefully if you come back on again, that would be amazing, Gene. No, I'd, I'd love to come back on again. And thanks, I really appreciate, you know, coming on and talking about movies. And I, I, can I recommend one more movie? Can I recommend one more movie? Because, you know, I, I'm kind of like... Oh, you. yeah, I do. Uh, yeah. I wasn't, you know, I like... I'll watch movies. I like watching movies. But, yeah, I, I tend to watch more older movies nowadays. But another movie that got me back into watching... Not got back into watching modern, modern horror movies again, but I saw it and thought, you know, there are still good movies being made. Was um, I think it's from 20... 2018 or 2019 it's called the dark and the wicked and it's just okay. it's just a supernatural movie set on a farm but it's really good i mean it's really good and Zan, and it, you know and and sometimes when you see an actor you're like oh, i'm gonna watch that just based on that xander berkeley's in it so i'll watch that because xander berkeley's in it um it sounds yeah. interesting so yeah I've, and it was I've yeah it, that. that's, uh, that's, um, that's, that's a really yeah. good film oh wow i'll have to check that out that is available on prime um so yeah, I'll have to ch- I'll have to check that one out. I I, I love I love to do. I'm literally just always when I'm talking to people, they say a film. I'm I'm like right. I'm putting that on my list. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's the it's the it's the best. That's, that's one of the best things about doing this channel as well is that people who just who I talk to or have other channels, they're just like, have you seen this? And I'm like, nope. Um, and I want to now. So yeah. Um, so no, thank you, Gene. And and I know that we'll um we'll talk again and keep in touch with what you're doing just all the best of luck with it because it's just for me it's 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 just right up my street and i know i can think of so many people who were who were really excited about seeing the um the blade cuts deeper as well so you know thanks so much for coming on i really appreciate it thanks matt appreciate it thank you very much